Hello, everybody, um, and a warm welcome to the third installment of the Econ 101 series, in which we invite our amazing alumni to share their opinions on uh, the data economy. And today we have the joy of having Eric Budish come and talk to us today. Eric is the Paul G. McDermott Professor of Economics and Entrepreneurship at Chicago Booth, uh, which he joined in 2009 after getting his PhD from Harvard, supervised by Al Roth. Eric's connection to Oxford is that he did his MPhil in economics at Oxford, graduating in 2004. He was in a Marshall Scholarship. And as uh, his CV still reminds us to this day, he was the runner-up to the George Webb Medley thesis prize, um, which was supervised by our very own Paul Klemper. Um, he's won many awards. Um, he didn't win the, the thesis prize, but he did win many honors since then, including being one of the eight American early career economists to get the Sloan Research Fellowship in 2015. Um, Eric has written some of my all-time favorite papers in market design, including one on allocation of courses to students at Wharton Business School and one about replacing the continuous limit order book in financial exchanges with frequent batch auctions. So it's a joy to be moderating this talk. Um, and its title today is going to be the economic limits of Bitcoin. And Eric, we, uh, we give you between 35 and 40 minutes. Uh, participants, please put all your questions into the chat. We will collate them and um, ask them of Eric um, at the very end. Eric, go ahead and share your screen in a fast and competent manner. Yeah. Uh, at least second best. Let's see if I can get this done. Great. Well, it's great. It's great to be with all of you, and thank thank you, Alex, for organizing this this event and for the invitation. And uh, let me let me give a special thanks to my, my mentor and MPhil supervisor, Paul Klemper, whose uh, book has has pride of place on my uh, chaotic bookshelf. Uh, behind me, I think I started my MPhil at Oxford almost 20 years ago at this point. So I'm starting to uh, feel the joys or curses of middle age. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you today about a, a, a research paper I've been working on over the last several years that has a, a somewhat somewhat skeptical take on the economics of uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. The title is The Economic Limits of Bitcoin uh, and Anonymous Decentralized Trust. Uh, on the blockchain. So with, without any further ado, let, let me get into it. And Alex, please, uh, th thank you for moderating and please interrupt with any clarifications as we go. And I look forward to a, a vigorous uh, Q&A towards the end. So Satoshi Nakamoto, the in inventor of, of Bitcoin, from a scientific perspective, what he or she or they invented is a new kind of trust. And it's a type of trust that is completely anonymous and decentralized. It doesn't have support from all of the usual sources that support trust in the economy, like rule of law uh, or reputations or relationships or collateral in a contract, uh, trust intermediaries. It's completely anonymous and decentralized. Uh, and at a high level, what Nakamoto invented and I'll go through the details of this uh, shortly, is this elaborate scheme, really quite creative and ingenious scheme, uh, combining ideas from computer science and economics to incentivize a large mass of compute power from around the world, freely entering, freely exiting compute power to pay attention to and collectively maintain a data set. And by collectively maintaining a common data set, uh, and collectively paying attention to a common data set, this enables trust uh, in this common data set. And this invention enabled cryptocurrencies where the data set is a ledger of transactions. I'll, again, I'll go through this uh, in a few slides. Uh, the most famous of which is Nakamoto's own cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. And the, the data structure that's maintained in this elaborate way is called a blockchain. And it's useful to distinguish between those two terms, blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Again, I'll, that'll become more clear as I go to. I think it's not an understatement. I, I don't say this lightly. Uh, Paul, Paul taught me to choose my words carefully and to be a clear writer. I think it's no understatement to say that um, Nakamoto's invention captured the world's attention. 
at it, one measure is that it's at its recent peak, uh, the valuation of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies exceeded three trillion dollars. But even this figure seems to understate the amount of attention that's been paid to this, like, this topic, the cultural, political, and commercial attention, where figures ranging from the heads of central banks to senior government officials to Jamie Dimon uh, and uh, Lloyd Blankfein to Warren Buffett to Katy Perry to Reese Witherspoon, the celebrities around the world are, are giving their opinions about uh, Bitcoin and, and, and other crypt cryptocurrencies. Yet even so, 13 years on from, from the initial launch, the, the, the usefulness of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, I think, remains genuinely an open question. Uh, to date, the majority of the volume appears to be speculative. Uh, the other widely documented use case is uh, black market activity. And there's some good academic research documenting these facts by Makarov and Schwar and Foley et al. Um, ironically, most of the speculative volume is through exchanges, which are themselves a form of trusted financial intermediary, which is kind of ironic. I'll come back to that too. Um, and meanwhile, Bitcoin's consuming about 1% of global energy, a bit less uh, than 1%, and about 15 to $20 billion a year of deadweight loss associated with the maintenance uh, of the data structure. Uh, and Ethereum, the other largest cryptocurrency, is another 15 to $20 billion a year of deadweight loss associated with maintaining its, its data structure through its, its version of anonymous decentralized trust. Um, here's the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. I think this is a relatively common uh, view. It's, Bitcoin's not widely used as a transaction mechanism to the extent it is used. I fear it's often for illicit finance. It's highly speculative. And when I say common view, I mean common view among uh, uh, re regulators and other government officials. Here's the U.S. SEC Chair Gary Gensler. Speculative, not much used as a unit of account. Can also enable extortion by a ransomware. Uh, to the extent that it is used, it's often to skirt laws uh, with respect to regula regulatory evasion. Um, what, what this paper is going to argue, uh, and what I've argued over the last several years, is that Bitcoin and the Nakamoto blockchain, well, I think, are undeniably an ingenious intellectual accomplishment, but are likely to continue to be economically limited. Um, and the, the core of the argument is that the cost of maintaining Nakamoto's new form of trust is extremely expensive. Uh, it's large in absolute terms relative to the stakes involved, and it scales linearly with the stakes involved. That's the most damning piece of the argument, I think, because what that implies is a, an if-then statement. If Bitcoin is to become significantly more economically useful than it is today, then the cost of maintaining it has to grow commensurately. And it's already really expensive without being that useful. So this suggests some skepticism that Bitcoin and its novel form of trust, again, a novel and genius form of trust, uh, will play a major role in the global economy and the global financial system. Uh, the heart of the argument is, is three equations. Um, the amount of computational work devoted to maintaining this novel form of trust has to simultaneously satisfy uh, two economic conditions. So one is a, a free entry, zero profits kind of condition. That's from you know, this, this event series is called Econ 101. This is most genuinely Econ 101. Uh, it's a zero profit condition for the maintainers of the trust. How much computational work are you going to get? However much you pay for. That's what equation one says. What equation two says is, well, how much trust do you get? from this amount of computational work. And what this betrays is that the vulnerability of Nakamoto's novel form of trust is it relies on a majority of the anonymous decentralized compute power to behave honestly. It's sort of a, a majority rule type of consensus system. So the vulnerability is if you come in with more compute power than is currently being devoted to maintaining the trust, you can attack the system. And this generates a kind of incentive compatibility constraint. So equation one is how much trust do you get? However much you pay for. Equation two is, well, how much security do you get? Well, however much you trust you paid for. Um, these two things together imply a third equation, which is quite damning, which is that the recurring payments to, to miners, to this large mass of compute power around the world, 
for maintaining the trust has to be large relative to the value of attacking the system. And that's just a very expensive trust model. Um, it, and you can think of it as sort of like a large implicit tax. So if you want to secure the system against an attack for a million dollars, the flow payments have to make it such that it's too expensive to attack to gain a million dollars. And this, this implies transaction taxes, per transaction taxes on the order of three to 30 bucks. It's actually less than the tax today implicitly, but everything scales very linearly. So to secure against a billion dollar attack requires a, a transaction tax about a thousand times larger. Um, there's a way out of my argument which I think is, is correct, but itself problematic, um, which is that if the technology used to maintain the trust is very specialized um, and an attack would not only steal some money, would you know, enable an attacker to double spend some funds, but would actually cause the whole, the whole system to collapse. So if it's, a, if it's fragile and an attack would cause Bitcoin's value to, to, to collapse, then an attack's a lot more expensive because the specialized capital becomes worthless. Uh, but this is this is sort of a, a dangerous way out because it's conceding vulnerability to an attack which causes collapse. So I call this the pick your poison argument. You either have to accept a large implicit tax on this kind of trust or you have to accept vulnerability to sabotage and collapse. And the analysis ultimately points to some specific collapse scenarios that I'll go through towards uh, towards the end. Let me make a disclaimer, which is I do not have an account of why Bitcoin's price has fluctuated the way it has. Um, at some level, uh, my paper is arguing that Bitcoin's economic usefulness is likely to continue to be limited. A natural conjecture is that low usefulness implies low asset value, but these are separate things. And I, I honestly don't we don't have to understand everything to understand something. And this this I, this link I don't understand. I think also confusing is just the, how much of the volume at present goes through um, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges like Coinbase or Binance or FTX, uh, where you're essentially trusting a different type of financial intermediary. Um, again, I don't, I, I don't get that, but it's a separate, uh, separate issue for my paper. All right, so let me get into the heart of the talk. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes giving an overview of the Nakamoto blockchain because it's a confusing topic. Uh, and if, at very least, I can, I can hopefully teach it to you at a level, uh, a level that's useful you know, for those of you who don't know. I'll then go into the heart of, heart of my argument kind of quickly, and then I'll spend some time going through some majority attack scenarios and wrap with uh, some questions for, for discussion. All right, so what is the Nakamoto blockchain? Let me try to describe this in about, about four, four slides. So think of a transaction as having a sender, receiver, and an amount and signature. So good old Alice sends good old Bob uh, $10, $10 or 10 Bitcoins uh, signed by Alice. And cryptographic signatures are, are better than signatures on checks in that they can not only prove the sender's identity, but they can also encode transaction details. So the signature can actually prove that it's Alice initiating the transaction and also encode that this is a transaction that could only go to Bob and is for $10. So Bob can't change the amount from $10 to $10,000 and Charlie can't change the receiver from Bob to Charlie. This so far is a standard cryptography that's been around uh, since the 80s or so. Imagine we were accumulating these cryptographically secure transactions on a Google spreadsheet. Um, so Eric sends Alex some money, Alex sends Paul some money, and, and so forth. Um, the signatures would enable a certain level of security in each of those transactions. So if there was an entry in which Alex sent Paul some money, we could all be confident that it was Alex who initiated that transaction from the signature. But there are some obvious problems, which is, I could send money I don't have. I could send money I do have, but to, to Alex and Paul at the same time, multiple parties. I could send money to Alex and then delete that uh, payment from the, from the record and send the money instead to Paul. Uh, so that doesn't work. Uh, imagine we have a transactions uh, that are maintained by a trusted party that keeps track of transactions and keeps, tracks, keeps track of balances, uh, sort of like a bank. Uh, and that would actually work just fine regarding all three of the security issues that I just listed above, 
but requires a trusted party. And, and Nakamoto was trying to generate a new kind of trust. So what did Nakamoto create? Users submit transactions to a pending transactions list that's called the mempool. And this you can think of as like this, like a giant Google spreadsheet, uh, but they're not, those transactions aren't considered official yet. A large mass of compute power then competes for the right to add transactions to the official record called, uh, uh, called the blockchain. Transactions get added in, in blocks of transactions at a time. For a block of transactions to be uh, valid, uh, each of the individual transactions has to be properly signed. So if Alex sends Eric some money, the signature has to come from Alex. It has to be funded given previous blocks. So if Alex sends Eric some money, Alex better have the money given history. And it can't contradict other transactions in this block. So if Alex is sending Eric some money, he can't send that same money to Paul in the same block. So that's what a valid block of transactions means. Here's visually what a block looks like. So here's a bunch of transactions. Alex sends Eric some money. Some other people send some other people some money, each properly signed. And this block connects to previous blocks and to future blocks using a cryptography idea called hash functions. I'm going to put that aside for now. Right, what is the computational tournament? So for the right to add a new block of transactions to this data structure, um, miners compete in what's essentially a, a, a huge competition to find a lucky random number. Where what a lucky random number is, is it's a, a string of numbers and letters where when it's hashed together with all of the other data in, in the block of transactions, spits out an output that by astonishing coincidence has a huge number of zeros at the start of it. So here's an example of a, of a hash from a recent block of transactions. Um, and it's got 19 zeros in a row at the start of it. And each of these digits could be zero to nine or A through F, so if there's 16 choices. So having 19 zeros in a row is something like a one out of 75 billion trillion event. So the computational tournament is looking for a lucky random number that, um, generates a hash with a huge number of leading zeros. It's kind of, it's kind of a, it, it, the, current, the system's currently looking at 200 million trillion uh, lucky random numbers per second. A miner who, report, who finds one of these lucky hashes then reports their blocks. It says, oh, I'm going to mine these thousand transactions and here's the lucky random number I found. Other miners can check that they actually did this, that they actually do have a lucky random number and then start working on the next block. And the miner who finds the lucky random number gets paid with new bitcoins. That's where the phrase mining comes from. They've mined, they've, they've mined new bitcoins as a um, payment for maintaining the data. And that's worth about $300,000 per uh, 10 minutes, so six, six and a quarter bitcoins per 10 minutes, plus some, some fees as well. Uh, and then the, the last piece of the invention is, uh, what is what counts as the official record? And Nakamoto proposed a convention called longest chain so that miners, once, once a particular block is mined, miners have incentive to keep mining, uh, building off of that block. Um, and if there are multiple chains, um, the official record is whichever one is the longest. Um, and there is uh, intuitively, this provides incentive for miners to focus their efforts. Uh, on the current longest chain. And this, this, this idea has received a lot of game theoretic attention, uh, most generally by Bruno B.A. and, uh, and co-authors. But all of this work assumes that miners are small, so it assumes away majority attack, which is the, the vulnerability at the heart of my, uh, my analysis. All right, so here's the, the, the visual again. So, all right, let's, so let's summarize what Nakamoto's created. And I'm going to summarize it using Nakamoto's own abstract. Uh, the network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work, forming a record that can't be changed without redoing all of the work. The longest chain serves not only as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool uh, of computer power. As long as a majority of computer power, excuse me, is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and uh, outpace attackers. So we've created anonymous decentralized trust. The trust in this data set emerges from this large massive compute power 
competing to find lucky random numbers and, and paying attention to this data set incentivized to do so to the tune of 300,000 bucks per 10 minutes. But the vulnerability is vulnerability to a majority attack. If, a, if you have a majority of the compute power, you can attack the system. All right, so let me, let me get into the heart of my analysis. Um, and let me, um, there's a funny quote from Matt Levine that I'm going to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll note briefly, which is the phrase blockchain is sometimes used by um, commentators who are describing the, the data structure, but without the novel creative form of anonymous decentralized trust. So without actually the central intellectual innovation of Nakamoto. So here's the Matt Levine quote. He says, if, you're, if you announce that you are updating the database software used by a consortium of banks to track derivatives trades, the New York Times will not write an article about it. If you say that you are blockchaining the blockchain software used by a blockchain of blockchains to blockchain, blockchain, blockchains, the New York Times will blockchain a blockchain about it. And he's kind of having some fun with how much hype goes to projects if they're called blockchain, not database. So you, it used to be that a ser serious people would say, well, I don't believe in Bitcoin, but I believe in the blockchain. But it's sort of like saying, I don't believe in Bitcoin, but I believe in the database, which is a totally reasonable thing to believe in, but it doesn't sound as sophisticated. Um, my critiques of blockchain in the sense of, of Nakamoto with the anonymous decentralized trust. I think distributed ledgers are totally useful and, and valuable uh, technology. There's a lot of also activity between these two polls that we'll come, sure come to in the in the Q&A. All right, so let me get into the, the three equation critique. Um, I'll keep this very high level, um, but the, the, the argument in the paper is not much more complicated than I'll give it on these slides. Let's say that uh, P is the reward to the winning miner who finds a lucky random number. So think of P as the $300,000. Uh, let little c be the per block cost of one unit of compute power. So this is like the cost of one lotto ticket in this computational tournament. And then let n be the amount of compute power in the computational tournament. So how many lotto tickets are there? Free entry equilibrium, so zero profit, says n times c equals p. So the each, each unit of compute power Take, take the total amount of compute power times the cost per unit of compute power, and that's going to dissipate the prize. If there's $300,000 of reward per winning miner, we're going to expect on average about $300,000 worth of compute power uh, per block devoted to that prize. If there's less than $300,000, there'll be an incentive to enter. If there's more, there'll be an incentive to exit. Very standard free entry economics. All right, what is the incentive compatibility condition? Well, what's the cost of a majority? N star times C per block. Let's say you have an attacker with an A majority. So um, if I'll use the notation that um, if I have, if, if the honest miners have one and I have say 1.5, that's sort of like I have 1.5 over one times 1.5. So three fifths of the total compute power. An A attacker who has an attack that takes T time, their cost is uh, A times T times N star C. Let's say the value of an attack is big V. Um, the incentive constraint is that the cost of attack on the left-hand side here, so A times T times N star C, had better be larger than the value of an attack, look, big V. That's equation two. So, so far, just zero profits and incentive compatibility. So let's stitch these two equations together. What the reason they're able to stitch together is that the, the cost per block on compute power is on both equations. Let's stitch these two things together and you get this equation that says that the payment to miners per block had better be large relative to the value of an attack divided by a constant term. Right, so in words, the equilibrium per block payment to miners for maintaining the trust has to be large relative to the benefits of attacking the trust or the flow payment to miners has to be large relative to the stock value of attack. And that's just a very expensive trust model. What makes it so expensive is it's totally memoryless, right? The system's only as secure as the amount of compute power devoted to maintaining it right now. Uh, where does trust usually come from? It comes from rule of law or reputations, brands. The Nakamoto trust model is like a brand is only as trustworthy as its flow investment in advertising. So like a brand is only as trustworthy 
Oxford is only as trustworthy as the amount it's spent on marketing in the last hour. It's sort of like a ridiculous trust trust model. Or military is only as secure uh, as the number of soldiers uh, on its border right now. Whereas in practice, uh, military security models will have some amount of security at the border, but then if there's an attack, you call in reinforcements, call in significantly more reinforcements. Um, from a security perspective, what's damning about this trust model is how linear it is. Uh, to secure the system against a billion dollar attack costs a thousand times more than to secure the system against a million dollar attack. And the usual alternatives are things like cryptography or rule of law. Again, Im imagine a company is only as secure as the dollar value of its compute power. Whereas in practice, cryptography provides significant security, right? The, to attack Bitcoin, you need to have more compute computers than the honest miners. To attack modern cryptography, you'd have to have, I did this calculation, if you had a trillion Amazon Web Services, each working for, four, working for 14 billion years, the life of the universe, you'd still be nowhere close. So cryptography is a very nonlinear form of security. Um, all right, so let me spend the last five or 10 minutes talking about uh, majority attack scenarios. So what an attacker can do is they can solve computational puzzles fast. So then they can strategically oppor uh, opportunistically replace the current chain with a different chain, which allows them to add transaction control what gets added and remove recent transactions from the blockchain. The attacker also gets subsidized for attacking because they earn block rewards for each period of their alternative chain. What an attacker can't do is they can't just quote, steal all the Bitcoins. That would require breaking modern cryptography. Instead, what they can do is engage in something called double spending. So here, here's a visual of, of double spending. So let's, let's say this is the last block before the attack. And here I'm an attacker. I send a billion dollars of Bitcoin uh, to, to Goldman Sachs and the Bank of England. Wait, I wait an escrow period. I then get back after my escrow period in exchange for the billion dollars of Bitcoin I get back um, uh, real assets. I get gold, pound sterling, dollars, what, what, uh, what have you. In parallel, I've been mining my own private chain. Uh, in this alternative chain, I send the, that same billion dollars of Bitcoin to a different account, say to my cousin or to myself, to a different account. And then after I get the billion dollars of gold or silver or, or traditional assets, I release this alternative longest chain, which I'll be able to do with certainty um, because I have a majority of compute power. So I'm faster. It's like the house always wins a blackjack. Um, and now I have both the Bitcoins I sent uh, and the billion dollars worth of real assets. So I, I've double spent. Um, do some simulations in the paper. Uh, if the escrow period is six blocks, which is fairly typical for Bitcoin, and I have a, this is a five ninths majority of the compute power. An attack would take about 12 blocks on average. And even for longer escrow periods, an attack would take 100 blocks is on the order of a day, 1,000 blocks is on the order of a week. You can go through what is this cost in dollars? A, a, a 12 block attack would cost about $5 million. A, a much longer attack might cost on the order of $50 million. Um, and then let me skip over some of these transact uh, th these computations. What they're saying is that uh, to secure the system, let's say an attack takes about 15 blocks, which is a few hours, to secure the system against a million dollar attack requires an implicit fee per transaction of about $30, $60,000 a block. That's actually less than it is today. But to secure the same system against a billion dollar attack would require a fee that's a thousand times larger, about $30,000 per transaction. So even an attack value of a million dollars is already too big for Bitcoin at Starbucks to be, to be a realistic uh, scenario. And even if the attack gets much longer, so this is an attack that takes a full week, we're still talking about implicit taxes per transaction of about $500 to keep the system secure against billion dollar attacks that take a full, a full week. Uh, so Eric, sorry, yes. just before you, you go on, because there was a clarification question, could Please. you just quickly explain what an escrow period is? Yeah, thank you. So an escrow period is I send you money now. Let's say, let's say I send you Bitcoins in block one. Um, in and the deal we've struck is I'm sending you Bitcoins and you're going to send me 
um, traditional assets outside of the blockchain. So you're going to send me uh, British pounds or US dollars or some kind of traditional financial asset. An escrow period is how long will you wait between when you see the transaction posted to the blockchain and when you release the real assets. So an escrow period of six blocks would say, and that's very traditional for Bitcoin, would say, if I send you money in block one, you're going to wait until blocks two, three, four, five, six, and seven are mined. After block seven is mined, which is one plus six, then you will send to me the billion dollars of, uh, of traditional financial assets. You're, you're essentially assuming that, well, if I sent you a billion dollars of Bitcoin in block one, by the time we get to block seven, you can be comfortable that that transaction is part of the official record. But what an attacker would do is then subsequently replace all of those blocks, one, two, three, four, up to seven, with some alternative history, one prime, two prime, up to 10 prime, that's got, that doesn't, lo and behold, doesn't have your billion dollar transaction in it. So, so that's that's the, the way the, a double spending attack would work. So some some take and, and this these are this is a this is again in in the Nakamoto paper. This is not some obscure thing that I plucked out of thin air. And he explicitly or, or she or they we don't know who, who Nakamoto was uh, specifically talks about escrow periods and the, there's a um, mathematics that relates to something called the gambler's ruin problem and probability. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll come back to that at the end in Q and I'm glad glad to talk about it more. So some takeaways from these simulations. So very consistent with some early, modest uses of Bitcoin. It's also consistent with large scale black market uses of Bitcoin because users are willing to pay high costs. It casts doubt on Bitcoin as a major component of the mainstream global financial system. This relates to the escrow question where I'm sending Bitcoin on the blockchain in exchange for real assets off the blockchain. So dollars or pounds or, or what have you. A lot of DeFi is quite interesting because it's all internal to the blockchain. Um, and that actually raises you know, different questions, but not not possibly. Yeah, it raises different questions. We'll come, we can come back to that in the Q&A as well. Um, but for the system to be secure for large transactions requires really high implicit tax rates that are going to render it unusable for smaller transactions. I think the surprise to the computer science community in, in this analysis was that escrow periods don't provide more protection. And I think what they missed is, first of all, the attacker actually gets subsidized while they're waiting. I didn't go through that math in, in the slides here in the interest of time, but I'm earning block rewards while I'm waiting. And then two, I think more importantly, the, I think computer scientists studying this didn't think about the conditionality that if Bitcoin becomes what its proponents fantasize, then it will become more useful then it will become more attractive to attack. So that kind of if-then reasoning, which economists find so natural, thinking in terms of equilibrium, I think wasn't as natural to the cryptography experts who were studying Bitcoin in the early days. All right, the, the response to this argument is uh, what I'll call sabotage, which is suppose the, the technology used to maintain Bitcoin's data is very specific to Bitcoin. And that's, that's true. I'll give you some pictures of that in the next couple of slides. It's these computers that the only thing they know how to do is SHA-256, a specific hash function that's useful for Bitcoin hashing, not, not useful for anything else. And suppose the attack actually causes Bitcoin's value to, to decline precipitously. In this case, the cost of the attack is much larger than I've been telling you because the attacker not only loses the va value in whatever Bitcoin holdings they have, but also this capital they have, the only purpose of this capital is to mine Bitcoins, just became worth a whole lot less. So you want to charge the, cap the, the attacker a cost of capital that's related to their stock cost of capital, not the usage cost. Uh, so this creates a new constraint. I'll call this uh, N star times big C, the, the stock value of the capital. Um, and this might be on the order of 10 to 20 billion dollars, the, the stock value of, the, of capital currently devoted to Bitcoin. So if you believe that an attack would cause the whole system to collapse, not just I send money to Goldman Sachs and double spend, but in doing so, trust in Bitcoin completely collapses. 
then the, the cost to an attacker might be more like $10 billion or $20 billion. So significantly more than the numbers I've been showing you. So I think that's a totally valid response to my paper and an internally coherent argument. But it's a little bit pick your poison because you have to concede that an attack would cause the whole system to collapse for that argument to work. So then you have to worry about an attacker motivated by sabotage per se. Um, so again, you're, you're sort of with this pick your poison uh, of, of either implicit tax rates that are very high, or you have to concede a uh, risk that the whole system collapses on an attack. All right, here's a picture of those Bitcoin specific uh, computers. They're uh, to give you a sense of how powerful they are. If you had all of Amazon Web Services, which is $65 billion of capital equipment, um, you'd still have less than 1% of all of the Bitcoin hash power because Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin mining machines are thousands of times more efficient at Bitcoin hash functions than traditional computers. Uh, so if I'm right, and the reason Bitcoin hasn't been attacked to date is this specific capital plus sabotage issue, then you can predict what conditions would have to change in the market that would precipitate an attack and therefore collapse. Uh, so number one is just conditions change in the chip market. So if the chips become so cheap that you can effectively rent them or use them for free, then you're back to the mining cost is mostly electricity. That becomes more like a rental cost. So this could be as the tech matures or repurposable chips get, get better. Um, second could be if the value of Bitcoin falls. Uh, and then you have, for, for other reasons, that leads to a kind of a glut of chips relative to the mining equilibrium equation one. And third is if the value of Bitcoin grows, so the, the usefulness grows, uh, and then that incentivizes um, an attacker either as a double spender or um, for, for sabotage per se. 51% um, attacks have started to materialize since I first circulated this uh, paper, none for Bitcoin or for the main Ethereum or for any of the other most prominent cryptocurrencies, but for a lot of fringe ones. Uh, Bitcoin gold for 18 million bucks was probably the largest to date that I've found at least. Um, so let me let me conclude and I'll, I'll raise a couple open questions too. Um, so the anonymous decentralized trust invented by Nakamoto, my, my conclusion is it's ingenious, uh, but expensive. Uh, for the trust to be meaningful, the flow cost of running this kind of trust has to be large relative to the value of attacking it. Uh, it's like a large implicit tax. And to get around this argument, you have to concede two things. One is that the security comes from the use of scarce specialized chips that can only be used for Bitcoin. And that's possibly fine, although it's not what Nakamoto envisioned. And then second, more damningly, that if someone were to attack, the whole system would collapse. And that raises the, the possibility of, of a, an attack motivated by sabotage, per se. Uh, and then the analysis points to specific collapse scenarios. So the overall message is there's some intrinsic economic limits to how economically important uh, Bitcoin and, and Nakamoto's anonymous decentralized trust uh, can become. If it gets important enough, it will get attacked. I want to emphasize the model is totally consistent with, with low value uses uh, in the early years and also consistent with black market uses because black market users are willing to pay the high implicit fees. My skepticism is more about uh, becoming a mainstream part of the global financial system. Uh, I'm also not skeptical of distributed databases or distributed ledger technology, whatever you want to call it, uh, more broadly. And in fact, what, what this paper highlights is it's exactly what's so intellectually creative about Bitcoin and Nakamoto, this anonymous decentralized trust that makes it so economically limited. It's ultimately it's Achilles heel economically. A couple open questions. So one is, is there a way to do something that is in the direction of anonymous decentralized trust, but makes this paper's arguments less damning? And I think the most interesting in this regard is this paradigm called proof of stake. Um, the usual motivation for proof of stake is the electricity. So Bitcoin's currently using about 0.8% of global electricity. Proof of stake wouldn't require any. That's separate from the issues in this paper. I think it's, it's, a, it's a, good, a good issue, but it's a, it's a separate issue. Um, 
And the reason, the way you see it separate is there's still a cost of mining and proof of stake or you know, staking or whatever you want to call it. It's the opportunity cost of tying up stake. That has a cost, little c. Same economics goes through. But stakes have some memory to them. You can track like, oh, Alex, Alex's coin has been a good staker for the last several years. I kind of trust that. Oh, this coin, this, this just added, joined the system very recently. I don't trust it yet. So stakes have some memory. There's an opportunity to build trust in more traditional uh, economic ways where you kind of build reputation over time. That, that strikes me as at least in, uh, intellectually interesting and plausible. This is a very active uh, research area, and it's an open question what's possible between the extreme of Nakamoto, anonymous, decentralized, and at the other end, trust generated in, in, in traditional ways among known trusted uh, parties, possibly sharing a data structure. Uh, the second open question is just what do we make of distributed ledger technology without the anonymous, decentralized trust? Uh, computer scientists are, that I know are completely unimpressed by this from a scientific perspective. They say, oh, that's just a database. It's a database that's got specific features like append only, good timestamps, very clear who can do what. But the trust ultimately comes from traditional sources like rule of law and reputations and so forth. Uh, but the business world is very excited about this technology. And I think it's interesting to ask, is there anything economically interesting that emerges from this particular form uh, of, of database. So my, my last bullet point, Alex, you, you asked me to talk about NFTs. And so that NFTs from the NBA is kind of a, a perfect example. The National Basketball Association is releasing NFTs, non-fungible tokens that relate to you know, basketball highlights. The trust is coming from the NBA. The trust is coming from a totally traditional source. It's going through the Ethereum blockchain, which is to me sort of a gimmick. Um, the trust is coming from a tradi traditional source, but it's 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 kind of an interesting use of, uh, it's very clear what the database structure is uh, because they're using the blockchain. Uh, let me let me stop there. Um, I'm happy to take any um, any any questions, uh, comments, uh, discussion topics, whatever you like. I'm really glad to be with you all. Uh, thank you very much. Eric, many blockchains for your blockchain, blockchain talk. It was blockchainingly blockchain some. Thank you. It was brilliant. We had loads of questions coming in. Um, I'm, I'm picking just a few um, and hopefully I, my interpretation of them is clear enough. I think this is a, there's a question from Simon, which is a kind of contra your collapse point. And Simon says that in practice, if there were ever a large, um, I think this is double spending time attack. This attack will be noticeable, and this means that the nodes can simply choose to ignore the attacker's chain to continue to mine on the original. And in kind of uh, uh, a kind of classic economic reasoning, knowing that risk by sort of a kind of backward induction, an attacker mm -hmm. will never want to expend the hundreds of millions required to attack the network in practice. Um, was that sound reasoning to you, Eric? That's a I, that's a great question. Let me give you a few a few related thoughts about it. So I think one, one extreme version of that question is, so let me, actually, let me define terms and then answer the question. I think it's a very important one. <clears throat> Suppose Alex engages in an attack and what will that look like? It will look like in block one, Alex will, some anonymous account sends a large amount of money to various financial institutions. And then lo and behold, a couple hours later, block one has vanished and instead of something different. Um, and in, in the thing that's different, those transactions are gone. So Alex now has whatever money he's successfully captured from, uh, from, the, from the transactions in block one without having actually set those Bitcoins. So it would be noticeable that an attack had happened. And I gave you a list of a dozen attacks that have happened in lesser currencies that were noticed. So then the question is what happens? And I think um, one version of that is, oh, well, the Bitcoin community will come together and say, oh, block one, that was an attack. That was not real. Um, so block one was real. Block, this alternative was not real. Let's go with what really happened. And the community will decide. And I think that's totally valid. But then your trust is in the Bitcoin community which is not anonymous and decentralized. It's you're trusting 
um, you're trusting a small group of actors who have who are you know, running Bitcoin, if you will. It, it, totally reasonable, but it's it's not Nakamoto Anonymous Decentralized Trust. Nakamoto Anonymous Decentralized Trust comes through the blockchain as I've defined it in the longest chain convention. So I think if you want to make a game theoretic version of that argument, and one of my colleagues, Jacob Leshno, is working on exactly that, you have to say, okay, longest chain is not my consensus model. It's I have a different model. Here's what it is, and here's why it's game theoretically sound. I think you can't just reach to at at the moment of inconvenience, reach to community or reach to, oh, rule of law will come and punish the bad actor. I think those are totally reasonable arguments to make for practice, but they're not Nakamoto anonymous decentralized trust. That's calling in the calling in the government for backup when you need it, um, but relying on kind of libertarian trust ideals when you don't. It's a, it's, I, I think it's a really great question. I, 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 I've been grappling with that one for a while now. Excellent. It's a shame that Jacob was not an alumnus of Oxford, so we can't invite him to give a talk on his work. Um, super. So the next question is from Pete, actually quite specific. Pete L. Uh, asks, uh, how is your argument affected by the maximum limit on the number of Bitcoins and what happens when that's reached? That's a great question. So I am on record. So the, let me let me again clarify terms and then answer the question. There's another great question. So. So right now, Bitcoin, if you successfully mine a block, so you find one of these lucky random numbers, you get paid with new Bitcoins. So six and it started at 50 Bitcoins. Every four years or so, it halves. So it halved from 50 to 25 to 12 and a half, most recently to six and a quarter. It will keep halving every four years or so. And by the year 2140, it will be down to zero. Because I think at some point that the number of decimal places is so large that there's no more block reward. Um, at some point, the compensation to miners will have to come through uh, transaction fees, not block rewards. And uh, actually, Jacob Leshno has written about that and some computer scientists, Naranian and Weinberg and their collaborators, I, I, I cited it earlier, have written about that. That's a much less stable source of compensation to miners because um, you're essentially paying for the right to jump the queue. Actually, Ethereum seeing all sorts of weird front running behavior uh, related to, to fees there. Um, but um, as the compensation to miners, if, if the compensation to miners diminishes, then the amount of security diminishes too and the vulnerability to attack grows. And I, I guess like this kind of ties with the previous question. One of the things I'm worried about uh, longer term is an attack that comes from the inside. At the, right now, if you're a miner and you control a huge amount of mining equipment, the last thing you want to do is attack and bring the system down because you're getting paid $15 billion a year to maintain the trust. So why do that? And why, why break up that party? But if the payments to maintain the trust decline, um, which at some point in the future, they're going to have to unless Bitcoin becomes useful, um, then you worry, start worrying about, you know, attack from the inside. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I kind of continuing on that theme, uh, there is a question from uh, Steve W. And this is kind of related to chips becoming cheaper and things like that. Um, is there a risk of a full collapse to all blockchains? I mean, let's talk about, I suppose, Bitcoin here specifically. Once the first quantum computers are able to mine uh, uh, Bitcoin are created. I don't. So I think let me give you the, the honest answer, which is I don't understand quantum computing well enough to have a, a confident, um, a confident reply to that question. But in principle, if you can if you can break SHA 256, uh, game over, right? That this, this this whole system doesn't seem like it works anymore. If you can, because then I can go and I mean, Satoshi Nakamoto, him or her themselves, has I think it's a million bitcoins. I have to look up the number. The only reason why I don't have those bitcoins is because I don't know Satoshi Nakamoto's password. If you if you knew Satoshi Nakamoto's password, you'd be the richest person on the planet, oh, the third richest after Elon Musk and a few others. So. Um, 
the, the, that's probably the first use of quantum computing is to break Satoshi's password. <laughs> I'll subsidize many, many years of science. Uh, so yeah, this, the system will fall apart if someone breaks cryptography. And uh, presumably, I don't, I don't have anything more profound to say about it than just that kind of layman's observation. Fantastic. Um, yeah, presumably many other systems will be falling at the same time, so we might not even notice the collapse of uh, of uh, Bitcoin in the process. Um, a kind of some more um, kind of general questions, uh, if it's all right with you, Eric. Of so course, there's, yeah. you know, what you've mentioned this twice, which is the 0.8 percent of global energy consumption. Um, it, like kind of in your view do you think it justifies the use i mean is this a reasonable way of spending you know our societal resources on mining this thing uh i i think that's an easy no i think um i mean i don't i, I don't say that in a i say that in a social planner kind of way right i think if you were a social planner would you devote one percent of global energy to maintaining trust in bitcoin which isn't very useful yet i think the easy answer to that is no um so I, 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 I don't know, um, you could talk about cost to carbon and putting a price on carbon and all that kind of stuff. And I, I we could go down, we, we could have a, a lot of valid arguments about where exactly is the, um, not, not where is the market failure, because the market failure is a very traditional one, it's just environmental externality, but where exactly is the policy response that would, would change that math. And at some level, I, I don't know whether that 0.8% displaces other uses, other lower economic value uses of energy, even if the value of Bitcoin at the moment is mostly speculative. So I think I don't have a, I don't have a deep answer to that question, but my shallow answer is no, it's not justified. So let me ask you, I had a question, which is, you know, you make, uh, you, your argument kind of makes it sound like, you know, penetration and the use of Bitcoin is sort of homogeneous. But of course, the adoption of Bitcoin around the world is extremely heterogeneous. There are some countries, Vietnam, India, for example, where the use is kind of extraordinary, especially Vietnam, right, where it's the penetration of the use is really quite amazing. So does this sort of also undermine the argument a little bit? You can sort of imagine some of the countries essentially kind of free riding of all this kind of global action that is happening um in bitcoin and so even though you know the entire system is kind of bad you can see kind of pockets of concentration and you know perhaps value and um you know a country like ukraine which is of course going through a crisis which is huge adoption of, of bitcoin kind of a lot of benefits of this in the meantime so i i don't know i don't know the details on the ground of vietnam or or, or the ukraine well, let me speculate and i'll use vietnam ukraine is a special situation that's um let me let me let me let me focus on the easier one, which is something like Vietnam or El Salvador, or Venezuela, that um, uh, crypto enthusiasts have pointed to at various points in the past. Um, at some level, they're not using Bitcoin, I mean, that, and the way we know that is there. Bitcoin is two thousand transactions per ten minutes, and each transaction implicitly costs um, at current mining fees about one hundred fifty dollars. So just no, nobody around the world is using Bitcoin to buy a cappuccino. It, that's just not not happening. Um, what you can do is you can go to the coffee shop and on that Square terminal, click Bitcoin and Square will sort of make it feel like you're spending Bitcoin. But that transaction one is is only going to the blockchain in a in a batch netted way every once in a while. And two, you're trusting Square, you're trusting the coffee shop. It's much more, the, the, the trust is coming from a traditional source. So that the distinction that's often made by um, a crypto enthusiasts, which I think is a very clean, nice distinction. I like this idea, I like this paradigm, is what they call level one versus level two. And their, their, their kind of framework is, what if we use the Bitcoin blockchain only for really large transactions for which it's valuable to have the 200 million trillion computations per second of trust? But then if you and I go to the coffee shop and spend Bitcoin, let's not have 200 million trillion computations per second securing that. Let's have that secured in a more traditional way and just put a ring fence around it. And that traditional way that's ring fenced every once in a while, 
will net stuff to the blockchain. So maybe once a year, the the coffee shop nets you know, reports some kind of net transaction into the blockchain, spends a few hundred bucks, but it's not reporting every cappuccino. And I think that's the, again, I don't know what's going on in, in, on the ground in Vietnam, but that's my best kind of mental model for it. On the Ukraine thing, let me say something that I thought was just, or let me point out something that I thought was just so hopelessly cynical and disgusting. Um, so crypto.com sponsored the, um, I'm going to get judgy for a second, so bear with me. Um, Crypto.com sponsored the uh, Oscars in the United States. That's our big you know, ceremony, celebra- you know, giving awards to movies and actors and whatnot. And their sponsorship set you know, had all of these, this you know, very stark black and white screen of, uh, about what's horrible, what's going on in the Ukraine and how horrible it is, which of course is it's it's you know heartbreaking. And then said, donate money in crypto to the Ukraine and we'll match it. And then in the fine print, it said, we will match up to 1 million US dollars. So it was like, it was this moralistic thing. It was clearly advertising crypto as a solution to the Ukraine, which is ridiculous. And then it was doing it in a way that was completely hypocritical and you know, cover their ass in the fine print of, you know, only up to a million dollars and in dollars, not even in Bitcoins. So it, I find this like, oh, what about Venezuela? What about El Salvador? What about the Ukraine stuff is like, I don't, I, something about that line of argument really I, just strikes me as suspicious. It seems like it's trying to grit, trying to find something noble to justify something that's kind of a little bit slimy. The, the, the crypto, I'll send you screenshots of the crypto.com advertising campaign. I found it, I'm going to use it in teaching. It's good. It's so appalling. Um, great. I mean, I, I guess on the, the sort of theme of uh, using crypto for kind of simple consumer transactions and cappuccino buying and, and whatnot, um, Alexander has a kind of very broad question, but I guess we are kind of moving towards it is what are your views on, you know, the death of cash? I mean, is maybe it's not going to be bitcoin but is there a kind of do you think there's an overall trend towards a kind of complete removal of of cash that that lovely medium we have to be able to transact fairly anonymously in a fairly yeah. trustworthy way that's a great question let me i think there's two different takes on that question and let me answer the one which i feel more confident on which is and for the for the other one let me ken rogoff has a nice book called the curse of cash let me just plug that book let me answer the thing I'm more confident on, which is, I think something very valuable that has come out of enthusiasm about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is attention to the value of well-architected databases. So what, I, what I'm hopeful for, and, and also attention to the value of reducing unnecessary, unintended regulatory impediments to flow of funds. So like getting money from a one relative to another relative, if that happens to cross a, 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 an international border. Uh, so what I'm hopeful for is that we'll get to a better architected financial system. So better architected databases, uh, but where the trust ultimately comes from rule of law and traditional sources. So I'm, I'm, I guess an, another way of putting that is I'm hoping that Bitcoin puts some pressure, downward pressure on the cost of getting funds from A to B or the frictions of getting funds from A to B. But ultimately, my prediction is that when we're getting funds from A to B, it will be U.S. dollars or euros or British pounds, you know, something kind of old fashioned, um, hopefully through a better architected uh, technology layer where it's not so clunky. I mean, I, I, I still remember 20 years ago uh, this year setting up my um, my my bank account. Uh, well, I, uh, it was the HSBC in Oxford, a few blocks from Nuffield, and just the like the number of hoops you have to jump through to get. And it was like a few hundred British pounds. It wasn't. I wasn't. I was a student. <laughs> just the number. The so I'm hoping that we put some pressure on some of those technological impediments of moving money around the world. I think many international students will be able to sympathize. I don't think that's actually got any easier uh, in 2022. Um, 
Eric, we've got about a minute left, and uh, there's a lovely question that I, I'd love to close with uh, from Felwa, um, which is really a kind of a, a great sort of summary of your talk. Um, if the Bitcoin bubble sort of were to burst, or if you like, the system would come down for the reasons you describe, would all cryptocurrencies tank, you think, or will it just be Bitcoin? Can you think this thing can fall apart in isolation, or will it just bring the entire house of cards down? That, that's a hard, that's a, that's a great hard question. I think, I think our, our intellectual, let me, let me kind of close with a profound, a profound comment, which is you know, Bitcoin's a bubble either way, right? It's either a bubble in this sense, you know, what goes up eventually comes back down to zero, or it's a, if it stays up, it's a bubble because it, you know, in some sense was cre it doesn't have intrinsic value. If it's valuable, it's valuable because others think it's valuable. So kind of either way, it's a bubble. And our scientific understanding of bubbles isn't great. Um, I would I would point to, so Robert Schiller's written a lot about bubbles. He wrote Rational Exuberance about 20 years ago. Uh, actually, in 99, actually, so it was really well, it was prescient because it was before the dot-com bubble collapsed, you know, bubble in quotes, because calling anything a bubble, you know, you. I'm down the hall from Gene Fong. Or like, well, how do you know it's a bubble? Right? Um, so, um, but our, I think our scientific understanding of bubbles is is thin relative to their importance, and, and a lot of that understanding comes from you know, the economic models are okay, but a lot of, a lot of the understanding is more um, a, a broader set of scholarly tools like Kindleberger. Schiller wrote about what he called naturally occurring Ponzi process. I, I think that's a great phrase. So a Ponzi scheme, you all know, um, I recruit two, the two recruit four, the four recruit eight. Every layer of the pyramid gets paid, but at some level, at some layer, you run out of new people to recruit, the whole thing collapses. So that's a traditional Ponzi scheme. Uh, what Schiller called naturally occurring Ponzi scheme is when that kind of phenomenon plays out, but there's no man behind the curtain orchestrating it. There's no Mr. Ponzi. It just sort of happens. And uh, uh, actually, this is also related to that crypto.com advertisement. I was listening to a U.S. commentator, uh, Ezra Klein, who run, has a good podcast in the U.S., and he was saying what struck him about the Super Bowl ads was that they were saying, if you don't invest in crypto, it's because you don't get it. You're not part of the future. And it was you know, big celebrities like Matt Damon making these arguments. Um, and that's so if you think about it through the lens of the naturally occurring Ponzi process, that's like you're trying to recruit the bottom layer of the pyramid before the thing collapses. Um, so I, I'd be out of my lane if I made a confident prediction about um, bubbles, collapse of bubbles. I think it's a thing to be nervous about. If I, if I was in financial stability circles, um, I'd be trying to game out the what if scenarios of what if there's a collapse across lots of crypto assets, but I, I don't have an ability to make a confident prediction, which is, I guess, probably a good way to close any talk, an economist punting on something. But I'd be thank nervous. You. I'd be nervous. Uh, thank you. You were, you were both humble and you were clear and thank you for sharing your research and thank you for engaging with us on this topic more broadly. Um, and it's been absolute joy having you and thank you for taking the time. Um, I should very quickly advertise uh, the next talk in the series. It will be on the 4th of May. It will be Joe Perkins, uh, who was a student and then uh, later a uh, um, uh, did his, he was an undergraduate student then he was a graduate student at Oxford. He's now um, the chief economist at Cup, uh, Compass Lexicon and he'll talk about platform uh, competition. So please join us for that. But um, just to close off, Eric, again, thank you so much. Um, I can hear a round of applause of a few hundred people who are on the call at the moment. Um, and it's ringing in my ears and it's thoroughly well deserved. Thank you so much. Thanks to you and th thanks, to, thanks to Oxford for, for all, you've done, uh, all you've done for me and for the world. So I appreciate it. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you.